Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome from PBS NewsHour, Judy Woodruff. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. You've had such an interesting program so far. I think it says something about our great country that the issue that uh, has everybody's attention, the sexiest issue around, is the budget. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we're spending all day long on. It is important, as everybody here knows. Uh, and, and just to introduce this next discussion, uh, I think everybody's aware that since late last year, a small bipartisan group of senators has been working to try to forge a consensus agreement on how do we address the nation's long-term fiscal imbalances. Coming off the work of the Simpson-Bowles Commission, you heard from them a little earlier, this group has reportedly, they've been very careful about what they've said in public, but they've reportedly been talking about all issues, uh, including cutting entitlements, including uh, uh, spending uh, of, of a nature we're going to try to talk to them about now, and including tax increases. There's been a lot of speculation about what they've been doing. They've been remarkably uh, good, I would say, from their perspective in terms of not talking to the press. So it's, I think, a real uh, testament to the importance of this gathering today that they're prepared to come and talk to all of us uh, right now. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Senators Saxby Chambliss, Mike Crapo, Dick Durbin, and Mark Warner. Senators, thank you very much, and I just I just complimented you. Uh, as a reporter, normally we don't compliment uh, people for keeping things a secret, but uh, but his but it has been remarkable the degree to which the work that you've done has been kept uh, under wraps. So I'm going to start with you, Senator Chambliss, because you and Senator Warner were sort of the, uh, the I guess the two originals in this group, and it quickly expanded to include uh, to include others. Let me start with you. Where does your work stand right now? We, we know that you had a sixth member uh, in, uh, in Senator Tom Coburn. He fairly publicly stepped away uh, last week. Uh, and today, we were supposed to have Senator Conrad. He, at the last minute, had to be on the floor of the Senate uh, because of a Senate debate, the vote coming up at 5 o'clock. But, but give us a sense of, as of today, where do your discussions stand? Well, first of all, let me say, Judy, that the, the, what you mentioned is exactly right about the fact that we could have six senators sit in a room for almost six months in this town and uh, the contents of the discussion not get out. That's the way the Senate used to work, and our goal was to make it work that way from day one, and these folks have just been tremendous to work with. We've talked about a lot of sensitive issues, obviously, and um, this issue in and of itself is so complex that every time we would reach a point of mutual common ground on one issue, then something else would pop up. And that happened during the course of all of this, and at times all of us became frustrated, but we always came back together. Uh, unfortunately, Senator Coburn made the decision last Tuesday to exit the group and, as he said, take a break. Uh, I'm not um, uh, giving up hope that Tom's going to come back. And this needs to be a bipartisan agreement if we're able to reach one, and we have gotten close. And uh, we're very hopeful that at the end of the day, Senator Coburn's going to rejoin our group, but I can't say when that's going to be. Senator Durbin, uh, you've been a, a, a member of this group uh, from the outset. What do you, how hard has it been for the six of you to sit there, three Republicans and three Democrats, to talk about these issues? It has not been hard. Uh, I think we like one another, and that helps. We have a different point of view on some issues, and we've tried to work through them. It almost sounds like a legislative process, uh, and it's something that we want to encourage, and I hope that if we can move forward from where we are today, that it'll be a model for our colleagues uh, to join us toward a solution. I know what the alternative is, as the majority whip in the Senate, with 53 members needing 60 votes, I can tell you that it's a very difficult task unless you have bipartisan cooperation. With a divided Congress between the House and the Senate, it's obvious as well. So 
it, it has been difficult on an issue basis, not difficult on a personal basis. We've come to like one another, and we've shared a lot of popcorn. Sen <laughs> Senator Crapo, is everything really on the table? I mean, we've been told it's spending in all its forms and it's taxes, revenues. Is that the case? Well, yes, everything is on the table. Everything has to be on the table. That does not mean, however, that we are not engaged in the difficult process of crafting the compromises that can deal on a comprehensive basis with a paradigm shift in America's fiscal policy in a way that can get 60 votes on the floor of the Senate. That means some things will not be on the table in the end after they've been negotiated out, or they will be negotiated into a form that was different than most people were looking at them. But absolutely, everything has to be on the table. And I was listening to, uh, to the earlier discussion about tax policy, which you referenced. And uh, frankly, uh, I, for one, agree that we need to have very significant tax reform. We need to change the paradigm in America from continuing to debate over whether to raise taxes and on whom, or whether to cut taxes and, and how that plays out, and instead focus on developing a tax code that will be more competitive globally for our businesses, will be more fair, less complex, and less expensive to comply with. And that will be a huge part of the solution. And Senator Warner, the reason I'm asking, I want to press a little bit more on whether everything's on the table, because what one hears on the outside is that one party is implacably opposed to revenue increases, the other party implacably opposed to any sort of significant entitlement changes. So how is the dynamic inside your group any different from that? Well, Jody, let's, and this is reiterating what you all have talked about all day long, you know, but this is the most predictable financial crisis that we're approaching in our lives. And we have used government's traditional tools already. We've used monetary policy. We've used fiscal stimulus. We shot those bullets already. So I feel kind of like the country or the Congress is Thelma and Louise in that car heading for that cliff. And we uh, felt like somebody needs to put the brake on. Somebody needs to say, let's not drive over the cliff, figure this out. There are ways. And you know, we took the Simpson-Bowles report as a starting point, where you can cut tax rates, look at tax spending, government spending by a different name, as Governor Daniel said, tax expenditures, cut back on those, generate revenue, and actually, for folks like Dick and Kent and I, maintain or improve the progressivity of our, of our tax system. There are equal ways on some of this stuff that's just math. With an aging society and with increasing medical technology, the notion of how we make our entitlement promises keep them in a fiscally sustainable way, we've just got to grapple with. I mean, and this is one, and let me just speak for myself, you know, Social Security doesn't contribute to the deficit. We don't think it, you know, it, but it, the idea that it's on a sustainable path just isn't true. I mean, Bismarck was the guy that set 65 as the retirement age when he was premier of Germany when life expectancy was mid-50s. Wasn't a bad deal if you outlived the actuarial tables. So with aging population, with 17 workers for every one retiree in 1950, three for every one now, we've got to make sure the promise of Social Security is there. So I think there is a real, and one of the things, I'm a new guy, but these, these senators and Kent Coburn and or Kent Conrad and Tom Coburn, you know, I, I found that there was a willingness to discuss everything on an intellectual basis, to kind of check your partisan hats. And I still believe in terms of a comprehensive approach that this is the, the, this is the best possibility. If we can start with a bipartisan group in the Senate, that's the way to move forward, not just in terms of a short-term debt extension, but in terms of a comprehensive plan. Senator Chambliss, you've said that you all are working off of the, uh, the, the Simpson-Bowles Commission report. Why not just adopt that report like it is? Well, it's easy to say you want to just take that report and put it into legislative language, but the fact is there, there were several options in the Simpson-Bowles plan on different issues. And um, we've had to go through and we've had to look at those options, decide which one we think is best, number one, but at the same time decide which one of those options we think is going to get 60 votes. 
uh, because we can go through all of this exercise and we can take all these arrows that we've been taking for the last five months and if we don't develop a product that's gonna get 60 votes then we haven't gotten anywhere. And um, the, the overall concept of Simpson Bowles is a very good foundation to build on and I think all four of us as well as Tom and Kent would say that we've taken Simpson Bowles and even improved it in some areas. Uh, because you want to give us an example? Uh, no. <laughs> I think what we've, done, we've looked at ways you can actually get it passed. Yeah, we've, I mean, we've taken some specific areas of, of the reform package, whether it's revenues, where we're, uh, we look at it as not increasing taxes, but increasing revenues. And anybody that thinks that we're going to repay this $14 trillion debt we owe, and by the way, even though we're down to five, that $14 trillion is still owed. So when we say we're continuing to work, that's why we're continuing to work. But anybody thinks that we're going to solve it simply by cutting 12 to 14 percent of the budget really isn't thinking seriously about this. And that 12 to 14 percent is the discretionary uh, portion of the budget. Um, that's why everything has to be on the table, as Mike alluded to earlier. And we have taken the plan and we have expanded it and we think uh, uh, made it better from the standpoint of both the spending reduction, both from the standpoint of reforming the entitlements as well as looking at the revenues. And while we're reducing tax rates a la Ronald Reagan, we're going to increase revenues a la Ronald Reagan. Uh, it's exactly the same sort of approach that was taken back then. We know it worked then, and we know it can work again without raising tax rates. And that's been a key ingredient that we've had to work through that does change Simpson Bowles a little bit. Is that changing loopholes, closing loopholes, Senator Durbin, and what else? Well, this commission, Bowles Simpson, finally opened a door which had remained closed in most of these conversations tax expenditures, the tax code, $1.1 trillion per year, deductions, credits, loopholes, exclusions, you name it. $1.1 trillion also equals the total amount collected each year in personal income tax in America. It is a significant amount of money. And what we have said, what was said in the commission, what we continue to say is it is a worthy exercise for the appropriate committees and members of Congress to sit down and make some value judgments. Are all of these things important for the future and growth of America? In my, from my point of view, some of them are not. Some of them are. What Bull Simpson said is if you eliminated all of them, if you eliminated the entire tax code, and then took the savings, 1.1 trillion, and dedicated anywhere from 80 billion to 180 billion dollars a year, then took the rest and dedicated it to reducing marginal tax rates, you would have a dramatic decrease in the marginal tax rates of Americans, 40% or more in many instances. So here's the question. Is it more important to you to have a marginal income tax rate, 40% less, if you can't have a complete mortgage interest deduction as you have it today? Good question, right? I think it's an important policy question. Maybe that isn't the place we go to make the change, but at least let's go through the exercise to find out how we can reduce rates in a progressive manner, remember where I sit on the spectrum, reduce rates in a progressive manner, and at the end of the day, have more economic growth and rid the tax code of things that frankly should have been gone a long time ago. Senator Crapo, is that the kind of thing that, that you can come to agreement on? Well, again, <clears throat> yes, depending on what the outcome is, and that's why the hard work of working through the various compromises that have to be made is so critical. Uh, again, I come back to the point that one of the most important and powerful parts of the Fiscal Commission's deliberations and outcome was the change in paradigm with regard to looking at revenue. As uh, we have already heard from Richard, the fact is that we will have a debate and we will promote a debate with our activity about just exactly where in the tax code should we make the adjustments and how much should those adjustments be and how should they work out. But the bottom line is we are committed to creating a tax code that is flatter, broader, and has a much lower set of tax rates that will not result in increases of taxes for American citizens and ultimately will generate a phenomenally more powerful economic engine that is critical 
It's absolutely critical to be one of the pieces of the solution to our fiscal problem. 